Okay, guys. <clears throat> Welcome. Oh, just one today. Right. So basically, we have certain conditions that we already considered for uh, stationary autoregressive processes. Okay. So I would like to develop this concept a little bit further. Okay. So it was because of the lack of so let's just recall it from plus, okay? So example, let's say we have lack polynomial, okay? So that just um, this is just a re representation of autoregressive processes, okay? So what is the lack polynomial? Okay. So again, for instance, it does the following. So if you have let's say l to the power of k and you multiply that by a process at time t, then what you're going to get is uh, the process at time t minus k. So this is what it does, okay? Basically, it's not a multiplication, or not a real multiplication, but let's say as if, okay? So as if it was, okay? So you have to denote it somehow. Okay, so this is how it operates, basically. If you perform this on a constant, okay? So if you have a lag polynomial and you perform this on a constant, then it's going to be the same. Okay, so it doesn't change. All right, and certain characteristics involve basically the the polynomial or the roots of the lag polynomial. Okay, you know what roots are? The roots of functions are. Okay, roots not not the square root, but roots in terms of in Germany you say Nullstelle. Okay, so the roots of the lag polynomial will determine whether or not the the corresponding autoregressive process is stationary. So if you let's say for instance you use another Notation, let's say, for instance, if you have a of l, okay, which is a lag polynomial times yt equals, let's say, a constant plus a white noise, and where you have that the lag polynomial, let's say, is going to be equal to 1 minus a1 times l to the power of 1 plus a2 times l to the power of 2, sorry, not plus, minus. Okay, so minus a l to the power of two minus and so forth minus a p to the power of l to the power of p. So then, basically, what you have is that this is just a representation of the autoregressive process. So what you have is basically that this is going to be equal to the constant plus a one times y t minus one plus a two times y t minus two and so forth, and then you have plus a p times yt minus p plus the white modes. Okay? That's what you what you're gonna get. Okay, so this is what will how the representation will work. Okay? I hope you understand this. Okay? We already had this last time and certain characteristics that the black polynomial has will determine whether or not the process is stationary. Okay? So this is what we already considered. Okay, now let's have a look at the example of the first order autoregressive process. Okay, so we already did this, but um, I need I think I need to repeat this here in this this, this case. So I mean of the first order autoregressive process, so let's say y is a autoregressive process of order one. Okay, so basically this means that yt can be written as a constant plus a factor times yt minus one plus a white noise. This is the general equation for an autoregressive process of order one. Okay? Now if you want to want to um, represent this by means of a or let's say define, okay? So it's enough to find a lag polynomial as you would have one minus a times L. So then what you what you have is that the lag polynomial times yt or times this process equals the constant plus the white noise is what you're going to get. Okay, so basically the same result as in the previous case where you have um, an autoregressive process of order p. So here you have an autoregressive process of order 1. So this is the first order autoregressive process. But, you know, uh, I just, what I do is just I redefine the lag polynomial as such as you can see it here. So 1 minus a times l. Okay, so l is basically the lag operator, okay, so this is the lag operator, so if you multiply that by yt, then what you're going to get is 
basically the constant bus epsilon t. Can you see that? Is that, does it make sense? Okay. Question, ladies? No question. <laughs> what is, like, after, like, the line AL is equal to, is that a one? Or th yes, this oh, is okay. one. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. She can't read this. Okay. So one minus A times L. Okay. And do you write it other way? I mean, different shape or something like that, maybe. I'm so used to the European notation, okay? So, of course, in the US, you write like this. Oh, but it's okay, like now that I know it's fine. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> it is how it is, okay? I'm so used to that, so yeah, 1 minus A times L, okay? This is the leg operator, okay? Now, guys, if you, if you simplify that, then you can also do as follows, okay? So yt is basically equal to the constant plus the white noise divided by AL, okay? That's the same thing, okay? So this is the representation. And that is going to be equal to, and then you can see this here, so this is going to be equal to V divided by A of 1 plus the white noise divided by AL, okay? Okay, now this is equal to A1 because if you split that and you apply this in a constant, then it's not going to change it, basically, okay? So that's, that's obvious, okay? Okay, right? Okay, so that changes. I mean, you can keep that, okay? So you can keep that as AL, okay? Or AOL, to be precise, here as well. But if you apply that polynomial in a constant, then it will become AO1, okay? Because the lag operator just cancel out, okay? So if you apply it on a constant, then the lag operator just cancel out. So basically then, all you have is basically AO1, okay? So, I mean, in just to put it simple, so you have V divided by A, 1 minus A, and then plus 1 over lag polynomial times the Y points. This is what you get. Okay? I mean, if you just rearrange that notation, so this is, this is how you can represent the process. Okay? Maybe you remember that. I mean, there was, there was another notation for that as well. Okay? So I will... I also introduced it in the process as well. I mean, we developed the case, so in this case, um, that was what we were getting. Remember that? So, um, if we had a first order autoregressive process, okay, we did this by induction, okay? So then we were, what we were get is, and, oops, sorry guys, I was pushing a certain button, I didn't want it to, okay? So, we were getting the following notation. So this was V of 1 minus A plus, and then you have it here. So the sum that goes from I is equal to 0 to a plus infinity of A to the power of, sorry, J plus J. is so A to the power of J times the white noise, which is lagged by time J. So y t, uh, epsilon T minus J. This is what we had developed. Okay, now we compare this representation, okay, so this representation, the new one, to the old one, okay, so finally, this, that's why you have V over 1 minus A, okay, as a first fraction, okay, because that's going to be the same thing. So now we're going to compare the two here, these two, okay, so that one and that one, this is what we do, okay, so this is what we had last time, and this is what we have now. I developed this, it took like 20 minutes, okay, so I, t I, t I came up with that and uh, when I was using complete induction, okay. So what we're doing now is we're going to look at this function, okay, so A of L, and 1 over A of L is basically, and this is going to, what, you, what you're going to see here, so 1 over A of L here in this case is going to be equal to 1 over 1 minus A times L. Okay, that's, that's basically the lag polynomial here for this process, okay? And this will be equal to, and this is what I show you, okay? So by applying the Taylor, Taylor series, that this is going to be equal to, and you can see this here, so this is going to be equal to the sum that uh, equals from j is equal to 0 till plus infinity of a to the power of j, okay? 
times L to the power of J. Okay? That's going to be it. So as you can see this here, this derivation, okay, so I'm going to, as I derived this here, is much quicker than this one. Okay? So for that one, from, from here to there, this is what we did last week. It took like 20 minutes, okay? Or let's say 15 minutes, okay, by using complete induction. Okay? But by using the lag polynomial, you get this immediately. Okay, now the question might be here is that y is 1 over 1 minus 8, uh, 1 minus 8 times l equals to that sum. Okay, and the question and the answer is simple. Maybe you know that the limit of the geometric series, okay, so maybe you know this formula. Let me just recall this formula. So j is equal to 0 to plus k, and then uh, plus infinity, and you have a q to the power of j. Now this is going to be equal to 1 over 1 minus q. That's the first first thing, okay? So this is the limit here, basically, of the formula. And since the process is stationary, okay, so in this case, since here, in this case, the process must be stationary, we have to have that the, that basically, that the absolute value here of that coefficient a is less than one. So here, in this case, I mean, this is, this is only true if the coefficient here, q, or the absolute value of the coefficient is less than one, okay? Okay. So basically, I mean, what we have here is that one over the lag polynomial is finite. Okay, so the limit exists. Okay, if and only if the absolute value of the coefficient here of this one. Okay, so the absolute value of the coefficient is less than one, and that is basically a both a sufficient and a necessary condition for the stationarity of the uh, of the autoregressive process. So otherwise, if that is not true, then the process is not stationary. Okay? That's, I mean, this is what we were looking last time. So then we were checking out, and, and I generalized that for, for other. Okay? Now, of course, you should, I mean, you're supposed to do this, okay, by means of the Taylor series. I mean, what I'm going to do is, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to show you this formula. This is, this is quite easy to understand. So what I'm going to, what, what, what is, Basically, what has to be applied here, if you have a lag polynomial, if you have a higher order autoregressive process, then you're supposed to calculate this. Uh, you, you're supposed to calculate 1 over 8 uh, A of L. You're supposed to do that by means of the Taylor series. So this is what I'm going to do now. And this is part of the exercise, I forgot, I think 3.5 3 or something. Okay? So that's what you have to do there. Okay? So I'm going to do this for, for this case. Okay? So by using the Taylor series, that's what you do. No, 3.3, okay? So let's just, let just demonstrate this, okay? So we do, okay, so we show, okay, so we show in this case that 1 over A of L equals, okay, so the sum that starts at J is equal to 0 and stops at plus infinity of A to the power of J times L to the power of J. Okay, using the Taylor series. Okay. Now here in this case, of course, in this example, you wouldn't need the Taylor series. Why? Because you could also just apply the sum here for the geometric uh, for the geometric series as well. Okay, so this sum will be the same thing. But if you have a higher <coughs> order process, okay then you would have to, okay? So then you're, you're forced to do this, okay? So then basically you have no other choice, okay? So for first order autoregressive processes, it would not be necessary, but for higher order autoregressive processes, it would be necessary to use that the Taylor series. So if you see the application for the Taylor series and you know exactly, or you will know how this can be generalized for, for, uh, for higher order autoregressive processes as well. That's why I was doing it, okay? Now, according to the Taylor series, okay, so what you have basically is that the function, okay, so a function at point x is equal to the following sum, okay, so this is going to be an infinite sum that starts at n is equal to 0, and uh, you have plus infinity here, and then you have f n, okay, so this is going to be the nth derivative of the process at point x divided by uh, sorry, at point zero. So we're we're basically we're 
will calculate the Taylor series around zero. Okay, so here around zero. Okay, so then you basically what you have is that the the n derivative of the function at point zero divided by the factorial of n times x to the power of n. That's basically what the Taylor series is based upon. Okay? So this is the general setup. Okay, so we do this around zero, so then you're going to see how it works. On, and then you will be able to generalize that for high order autoregressive processes as well. This is how it's done. So that's why I'm doing it here, although it's, it would be negligible because it's, it's not ne really necessary. But let's do it anyway. Okay, so what we have here is a, a 1 over a of l. Okay, so 1 over a of l is basically equal to, and this is what we have, so this is going to be 1 over 1 minus a times l. So we'll, what we have here is basically the function that we need to show is that 1 over 1 minus a times x here, if the input argument is x. Okay? Now, 1 over 1 minus a times x equals 1 minus a times x to the power of negative 1. Okay? And I'm using this expression to calculate the first derivative of that. Okay? Now, by applying the chain rule, guys, the first derivative of that is going to be equal to negative 1 times 1 minus a times x to the power of negative 2 times negative a, right? So according to the chain rule, okay? So you have the inner derivative and then you have the outer derivative, okay? So the outer derivative is going to be equal to, I mean, you have something to the power of negative 1, which equals, I mean, if you divide this, you're going to have negative 1 times the function to the power of negative 2. This is what you have, so you have the other derivative and you put into the put that um, put the inner function into the other derivative times the inner derivative. Okay, so the inner derivative of the function with respect to x is going to be equal to negative a, obviously. Okay, so the inner derivative of the function is going to be equal to negative a. You see this? Okay, which basically equals and then you have it here. So this is going to be equal to a times one minus a to the power of x to the power of negative two. Okay, so that's going to be the first derivative. Now let's see how the second derivative evolves. Okay, so then we generalize this by induction. Okay? Now the second derivative you would have to do is you have negative 2 times a times 1 minus a to, a to the a times x to the power of negative 3. Again, you take the derivative of the other function and then you multiply the whole thing by the inner function. Okay? So you take the derivative of the other function, then you put in into, um, into it, you, you, put, uh, you plug in the inner function into that other derivative, and then you multiply that by the inner derivative, which is, of course, equal to negative a. Again, so what you have here is that you have 2 times a squared times 1 minus a times x to the power of negative 3. Okay? You understand this, guys? Okay? Now, if you continue, okay, so let's say what's going to be the third derivative of the function, okay? So then you will have is you have two t uh, 3 times 2 times a to the power of 2 times this expression. So what I'm, what I'm going to do now is, of course, you have negative 3 times 2 times a squared times this expression to the neg to our negative 4 times minus a. So this, is, this simplifies to so 3 times 2 times a to the power of 3 times 1 minus a times x to the power of negative 4. This is what you're going to get from the fourth derivative. Okay? So now here we can generalize this, because this is what we have, okay? So for the third derivative, you get 3 times 2 times a to the power of 3 times 1 minus a to a times x to the power of negative 4. For the fourth derivative, okay, let's do this again. What do you think what you're going to get? So you're going to get 4 times 3 times 2 times a to the power of 4 times 1 minus a to the power a times x um, to the power of negative 5, okay? That's, that's what you're going to get there. Okay, so then by applying uh, induction and computing this for the nth derivative, what you're gonna what you're gonna think what's gonna be the nth derivative here? Okay, so for the fourth derivative, you have four times three times two times blah blah blah. Then for the nth derivative, I mean for the fifth derivative, you would have five times three times two times five times four times three times two, which is the factorial of five, right? Okay, so here you have for the nth derivative the factorial of n, obviously, right? Okay, so that's, that's obvious. 
times a to the power of n. Okay, so here, if, if you have the fourth derivative, then you have a four here, right? Okay. You understand this? So if you have the nth derivative, then you have n here, you know, the factorial of n. And if you have the fourth derivative, you have 1 minus a to the power 8 times x to the power of negative 5. So you have negative 5. So if you have the nth derivative, then you have 1 minus a times x to the power of negative n minus 1. Okay? So negative n minus 1 would be, this will be the formula for the nth derivative of the function. Okay? Now all I'm doing is, I'm putting, I'm putting in into the formula now. So what I'm doing is, um, of course, I'm going to put zero in there first. Okay, so because we we evolved the Taylor series around around point zero. Okay, so this is what we what we have. Okay, so I'm, first off, I'm going to put zero here into this derivative. Okay, so the the, the nth derivative of the function at point zero is going to be equal to the factorial of n times a to the power of n times 1 minus a times 0, of course, to the power of negative n minus 1, which is, of course, this expression is equal to 0. So you have 1 to the power of that is going to be equal to 1, of course. So this is, of course, this simplifies to the factorial of n times a to the power of n. Okay? And then I'm going to ca calculate the Taylor series. Okay? So the function here at point x is going to be equal to, and this is this is what we have here. Okay, so this is this starts at j is equal to zero till plus infinity. Okay, so or let's call it n because we call it the, the nth derivative. Okay, I'm going to write down the formula again. So the nth derivative at point zero divided by the factorial of n times x to the power of n. That's that's a basic formula. So what I'm doing is I'm I'm putting in here everything into it. So basically, this is going to be the sum, okay, the same sum, and then here you have the nth derivative, so this is going to be the factorial of n times a to the power of n divided by the factorial of n, and then what, what you have here is the um, x to the power of n, of course, which simplifies 2, and then this is obvious, so here you have a to the power of n times x to the power of n from n is equal to 0 till plus infinity, okay? And that was equal to 1 over 1 minus 8 times x because that was equal to the function, okay? Right? So I did this by using the Taylor series and found that this is going to be equal to that. So hence, of course, and if you replace x by n or let's say x by l, okay, referring to the to the to lag polynomial and you re replace let's say n by j okay as we did before the basic what you're going to get and this is what we have here so 1 over 1 minus 8 times l is going to be equal to the sum okay we had j as a notation so I'm keeping that and here we have a to the power of j times l to the power of j that's it okay so this is what it what is about. Okay, again, for this setup, for first order autoregressive processes, it's not necessary to develop that from the Taylor series because you have the formula for the geometric series as well. But if you want to have higher order processes, then you need to do this by using the Taylor series if you want to now have another representation for that. Okay, so in case, in that case, for instance, I mean, uh, the question would be what would be if you have a second order autoregressive process, then you would have 1 minus a times l minus a2 times l to the power of 2. Okay, so that would be the lag polynomial. So depending on what you have, okay? That's, that, that's the way it works, and that's the way you should do it, okay? All right, guys. Then, uh, of course, and this is what we already considered, okay? Right, so here in this case, I mean, um, basically, um, you have the following conditions. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just uh, summarize here that. Okay, so basically, what you have is the process is stationary. Okay. Okay. If and only if, okay, 
So the absolute value here of this expression is less than one. We already had this last week, okay? Which is equivalent to that the roots of the lag polynomials are, have an absolute value which are greater than one, okay? So this is equivalent to the fact that the roots, okay? The, or the absolute value, okay? So the absolute value, value of the roots of the lag polynomial, okay, are greater than one, okay? Meaning the following, so if you have, let's say, the roots, okay, so satisfying that the, basically the function at that point is equal to zero, then what you would get basically is that the absolute value of the roots are greater than one. Okay. Again, this is relatively easy to see for the first order process. Okay, right. So for the first order process, I mean, if you would calculate the roots of the lag polynomial, if let's say a has an absolute value which is less than less than one, then of course the root will have an absolute value which is greater than one. Okay, and that can be generalized for also for other processes as well. Okay. Okay. So here in this case, of course, you have to denote that. Basically, okay, so y is an autoregressive process of order one, and then I'm going to use that condition for higher order autoregressive processes as well. Okay? Okay? Right? Okay? So that's, that's a lesson to learn here. Okay? Here in this case, these two are equivalent in case you have a first order autoregressive process. And now we'll try to generalize that for higher order as well. Okay, so basically what we have is, uh, okay, so let, for instance, let y denote an autoregressive process of order p. Okay, and this means that the following, okay, so here you have the following, so a of l times y t equals a constant plus a noise, okay, and of course, here in this case, the lag polynomial in general case is equal to 1 minus a1 times l minus a2 times l to the power of 2 minus etc. etc. minus ap times l to the power of p. Okay, so that's the general representation of the lag polynomial if you have a high order autoregressive process. Okay, so if the order is equal to p, then you have a higher order autoregressive process. So then, okay, so then, uh, so then, of course, what we have is um, basically y is stationary, okay, if and only if, okay, if and only if, if the roots, okay, the absolute value value of the roots okay roots of the lag polynomial okay are greater than zero I uh, greater than one sorry not zero greater than one yeah no no here uh, that was a mistake guys not greater than zero greater than one of course Sorry, sorry about that, greater than one. So I, I, I don't know why I wrote zero here. So greater than one here as well. Okay, please correct this. And here, greater than one. So basically it means that if, let's say, the lag polynomial has a root somewhere, okay, so then it should imply that the absolute value of it is greater than one, not greater than zero, sorry guys, greater than one. But you have to keep in mind here that z, okay, so z is not a real number, z can be a complex number here. Okay, so we have to calculate roots even for complex numbers, guys. So be careful, okay? So be careful, we are, I mean, we had an example for real numbers, but we, what we're supposed to consider that for complex numbers as well, okay? Okay, so if you have, let's say, a quadratic equation, Okay, 
and you find there are no real roots of the quadratic equation. Okay? Then you have to calculate the complex roots and then you, may, uh, you, you should uh, consider the absolute value of them okay, for them as well. So, okay, so for higher order processes, I mean for first order processes, it's not going to be the case. But um, Z can be a complex number, guys. Okay? So keep that in mind. You know what a complex number is. Okay? So a complex number is basically a number that can have mm, the square root of negative 1. Okay? So that's, that's the representation here of that. Okay? Mm, you don't understand what I'm talking about? So, no? Okay? I mean, let's have a following example. So x, let's say you have x, x squared plus 2 times x plus 2 equals 0. Okay? Right? So then, what you're going to get for the roots, x1, 2, is going to be, okay, so this is going to be negative 2 over 2, which is going to be equal to negative 1, plus minus the square root of negative 1 squared, which is equal to 1, minus q, right? Okay, so which is minus 2 here, so you have negative 1 plus minus the square root of negative 1. Okay? And this is a complex number, right? So this is a complex number. Of course, I mean, it's not a real number, okay? Because it doesn't exist, but this is a complex number. Okay? Right? Okay? So you have to be careful. All right? Good. Now, but I'm not going to do this in the exam. Don't worry. So you're not going to get complex numbers, okay? Just for you to know. All right? Maybe I will add some examples here into the, to the exercises and you see an example to that as well because it's not quite obvious maybe for you just to have to calculate the absolute value of a complex number, but I will introduce it to that concept as well, okay? But you don't need to worry about that for the exam, okay? Good. Now, okay, so you need to, need to consider that here in this case as well, okay? Now, a, another condition, okay, so for stationarity, okay, so, and this is what I will add here too, okay, so basically, so a process of, of order P is stationary, okay? okay? And you have the same representation as above, if and only if, okay? And you have the following, so if and only if, if the following condition holds, let's say, okay, so the following condition holds. Okay. So if and only if the following condition holds, namely, you have that, okay, so that the inverse, let's say, of the lag polynomial is finite. And how do you do, I mean, how do you examine that, if it, uh, whether or not it's finite? I'm sorry, guys. I don't use the internet here. I do not need this crap, okay? I'm sorry about this. Last time the computer was shutting down because it was constantly uploading something. I don't know. Okay. I mean, it's just, it doesn't make sense. If you don't use the internet with that, then and basically, if you don't have a car, you don't have to have an insurance for that, right? It doesn't make sense. It's still constantly telling me that I should upload my my virus protection, but for what? Okay, anyway, it doesn't matter, okay. It's, uh, I don't know, okay. Anyway, okay, so, and in this case, so this is finite, and there is a possibility to represent this by using a Taylor series, and the Taylor series will look, look like this, okay? So here you have one of A of L, and in a previous example, how do it look like? So sorry about this. Okay, so what I have here is this. Okay, so I'm going to write that down. So we had a sum, okay? So the sum starting at j equals 0 to plus infinity. And it looked like this. Okay, so let's check them out again. So it looked like this. Here you have a to the power of j times a to the power of j. Now for, for higher order processes, it's not quite clear, not always clear, how these coefficients will look like. I mean, here you just only have one coefficient, namely a. That was the only coefficient that the process has. But here in this case, we have multiple ones, so it's not quite clear. But at least there is a possibility to represent this as follows. So here you have alpha. I'm calling this alpha j, and alpha j are some coefficients. 
times l to the power of j, okay? So that means that this is station, uh, this is finite, so hence there is a possibility to represent this, uh, this expression by using certain coefficients, okay? So where basically, okay, so these alpha ones, alpha two, etc., etc., is just a sequence, okay? Or are some coefficients. All right? And these coefficients just have to have, or have to satisfy the following condition. They have to be absolute summable. Okay, so that's the condition that they just have to satisfy. So basically, right, so the only conditions that they have to satisfy is that they have to be absolute summable. Okay? So again, the inverse of the lag polynomial is finite. If you, if you express this by using Taylor series, then you would get a, basically you would get here a certain expression for some coefficients which are absolutely summable. That's the only thing that matters here, okay? And how these coefficients alpha look depends on the process itself, okay? So it depends basically on the order of the process. Okay, so for the first order autoregressive process, okay, so again, so just for, okay, so if let's say, okay, so if we have that Y is a first order autoregressive process. So then we would have that basically that alpha one was equal to A to the power of one, alpha two was equal to A to the power of two, alpha three was equal to A to the power of three, and so forth, okay? So that was the sequence, okay? And these coefficients were absolutely summable in that case. But, okay, so that just, for the first order autoregressive process, for higher order, you might have something else. Okay? It depends on the process itself. It's not quite clear how you would get this, but you can expand and you can find these coefficients by using Taylor series if you like. Okay, so by using the Taylor series, you would be able to find these coefficients, let's say for higher order autoregressive process, but this is something that you don't have to do. Okay? So there are numerical procedures involved in this. Uh, where you would find another representation for that. Okay, so that means that there is a possibility to represent this. Okay, so basically, I mean, then let me just summarize, okay, because this is what it means. Okay, so remark. So basically, if Y, okay, so which is a high order autoregressive process is stationary, okay, okay, so is stationary. Then it can be written as, okay, so then it can be written as follows, okay, so then you would have yt equals, let's say, a constant, okay, so a constant, then plus, okay, so you would have, and um, this is what we have, so a constant, sorry guys, divided by a1, okay, plus epsilon t divided by al, just as the same case as in the previous section, okay, and here in this case you would have that this is going to be a constant over A1, which is a lag polynomial, okay, and then plus, and then you have these coefficients, okay, so basically you would have that j is equal to zero, and then here you have plus infinity, okay, so then here you have alpha j times the lag polynomial times the, basically, times this expression which result in epsilon t minus j, so this is the representation that you would get, okay, and again, these alphas are certain coefficients, okay, that's basically the lesson to learn here, okay. Again, we developed this for the first order autoregressive process, but you can do this for the higher order autoregressive process as well. Okay? All right? Okay? Now, what we need to consider here, okay, so in this case, if, let's say, a higher order autoregressive process is stationary, then we have the so-called U-Walker equation, okay? 
and this is what I would like to introduce you to as well. And then we're going to prove this in the exercises. Okay, so then, okay, so this is a lemma. Okay, so if basically y is uh, an autoregressive process is stationary. Then what we have, okay, uh, is the so-called the U Walker equation, and we'll add this here. So what does it mean? So basically, it means that the correlation, okay, so the correlation, okay, with respect to lag H, can be written as a one times the correlation of H minus one, okay, or with respect to H minus one, plus a two times the correlation with respect to like h minus 2 and so forth, okay, plus a p times the correlation with respect to the lag h minus p, okay, that's how it is, okay, so, and a1, a2, a p and so forth are the coefficients of the lag polynomial, you may remember this, okay, so, of course, and then um, where you would have basically that AL is of course equal to 1 minus A1 times L minus A2 times L squared minus and so forth minus AP times L to the power of P. Okay? Now this thing is called the U Walker equation. Okay? So this is the U Walker equation. U Walker equation. Okay? So not this one, this one here, this one. Okay? That is a Walker equation, and we're going to prove that in the exercise. Okay? For stationary processes. All right? This is just a property. So basically, you would calculate the auto correlations like this. Okay? All right? So, and um, another remark involves, let's say, a second-order autoregressive process, okay? So let's say, okay, um, and this is what we also have, okay? So this is a remark that we need to examine, and this will be part of the exercises too. So we have a remark. Let's say we have, okay, so a second-order autoregressive process, okay? So order two is stationary, okay, if and only if the following conditions jointly hold, okay, so if and only if, if the conditions, the conditions, the following conditions jointly hold, okay, and the first condition, okay, so they have to they have to hold together. So if let's say all three hold, then basically then you have a stationary process. Okay. So the first condition is that the absolute value of this coefficient a2 is less than one. Again, what is a2 here? Okay, so for the lag polynomial, you would have for this process, see this is going to be equal to one minus a1 times l minus a2 times l squared. Okay, that's the lag polynomial, and a2 is a coefficient of the lag polynomial. So here you have to have that the coefficient of the uh, the coefficient a2 has an absolute value which is less than one. That's the first one. Okay, we're going to show this. Okay, so that's something that we're going to show. The second one is that one plus a1 minus a2 is greater than zero, and the third condition, okay, is that one minus a1 minus a2 is also greater than zero. Okay? This is something that can be shown, and I would like to give you an idea how these conditions apply here. Okay, so where they are, for instance. Okay, so let's say this is something that is satisfied. Now the question is, where are the corresponding points? Okay? Just let me, con this, uh, let me just consider, basically, that expression. So suppose that you have here the coordinate system. Okay? So here you have two axes, okay? And now this is going to be A1, okay? So this is the A1 axis, and this is going to be A2, the A2 axis. And the question is here, where are the points that satisfy, basically, these conditions, okay? So this is what I would look, try to look at, okay? 
right? So let's say, for instance, here you have here you have one, and here you have negative one. Okay, so if a two or the absolute value of a two is less than basically one, then you have here the points here between. Okay, so what I'm what I'm doing is here. So this is this is the area. Okay, this is the area for which the first condition applies. Okay, so I'm talking about this one. I'm not sure whether or not you can see this. Wait. Okay. Uh, this one. Yeah, you can see it. Okay. I also. Okay, so this area. Okay. This one. Okay. So between one and negative one, okay, represents the first, okay, so the range here of the first condition. Okay, so far so good. Okay. Now what about the second one? If you solve the second one, let's say for A2, okay, so then you would get what? Okay, so if you solve this for A2, so A2 is going to be what? It's going to be less than 1 plus A1, right? And how does this line look like? Okay, so this is of course a linear function for which basically you have the intersect is going to be equal to 1 and the slope is going to be, uh, is going to be equal to 1 as well. Okay, so if you have, let's say, 1 here, okay, and, uh, sorry, negative 1 here and 1 here, then this is going to be the straight line represented by this expression here. Okay, so this is going to be the corresponding straight line. Okay, and if you say that a two is less than that, okay, then this is going to be everything, or considering everything which is below this straight line here. Okay, so that's what you're going to get. Okay, so this is. This is the area that corresponds to it, okay? And again, they have to hold both, okay? So both of them have to be true, okay? So everything that you have here, everything, we're gonna satisfy this condition, okay? So both areas have to be considered, which are, uh, which are yellow and purple at the same time because they have to jointly hold, okay? So this is what, it, what is represented here by this equation, okay? And now the third one, if you solve this for A2, again, okay, so if you, if you solve the second equation for A2, okay, so then you would get the following, so this is gonna be, and then you see it here, so this is gonna be A2 is gonna be less than one minus A1, so this represents a straight line with an intercept one and a slope negative one. Okay, so if the slope is negative, okay, I don't know which color to take. Maybe I take blue. Okay, so I'm using this one. Okay, so this represents the the um, the third condition and everything which is below that. Okay, I'm rather using green because it's going to be too dark here. Okay, apologize for that. Okay. But you can use that um, as well, okay? And um, and basically, you would have that all points which are below that, all right? Okay, so which are below that point here, okay? Are going to satisfy the condition. So where are the points that satisfy all conditions at the same time? They are in the intersection of the yellow, of the purple, and of the of the green area, and this is given by this triangle here. Okay, so this is the triangle, this triangle here, okay? So this one, okay? This is what you have, okay? Here at this point you get negative two and two, okay? So here you have two and negative two, obviously, okay? And this is, the, this is called the stationarity triangle. So all points, okay? All points that you find here, I mean, you have A1, A2 combinations, okay? So for instance, this one. Okay, so if you have this combination, then for A1, A2, right? So then you would have that the corresponding autoregressive process, the second order autoregressive process will be stationary. So if it's in, inside the triangle, okay, then the coefficients are rep represented by the coefficients, then the corresponding process will be stationary, okay? So this is called basically the stationarity triangle. Okay. 
sometimes you also say stationary triangle, but a basically a, a triangle cannot be stationary because uh, you know only a stochastic process can be stationary anyway. Okay, so sometimes people use that too. Okay, you understand this? Okay. Now the question is, why is that? Okay. And this is part of the exercise 3.4, and I will try to explain this, at least for the first condition, right? So, basically, I mean, let's say you want to try to find the roots, okay? So, I mean, the lab polynomial here looks like this, so this is going to be 1 minus a1 times z minus a2 times z squared, okay? Which is going to be equal to 0. And let's say if I want to try to find the roots of the lab polynomial, okay? So Basically, what I'm doing is I will calculate the roots, okay? So then this implies, obviously, that 1 minus a time, a1 times z minus a2 times z squared is going to be equal to 0, okay? Now, if you try to find the roots, okay, I'm going to use the ABC formula, guys, okay? You, for solving quadratic equations, okay? So then you have negative b, okay? So b corresponds to basically it's negative a, so if you have negative b, then what you basically have is that you have, okay, so negative a1, so this is a1, obviously, of course, right? So then you have the square root of b squared, which is going to be a1 squared, okay? So a1 squared, okay, minus a4 times a times c, okay, so since you have that a is negative, which is going to be negative a2, so you have plus 4 times 1 time, uh, is times negative a times c. Okay, so here you have times a2 times 1, this is what you're going to get. And then divided by ne uh, negative 2 times a. Okay, so in this equation, a corresponds to negative a2, so here you have negative 2 times a2. These are going to be the roots of the corresponding lag polynomial, okay? And I'm going to show you that if the process is stationary, then basically these conditions hold, okay? So the first condition, let's say, okay? So the first condition must be satisfied, at least that one, okay? So the first condition, but this is, this is what, how, how you would calculate the roots, okay? You know the formula, you know how to solve quadratic equations, so, yeah? I don't understand that. Uh, you said that uh, complex solutions are... are yes. Viable. Yeah. No, here not. It's not. It's not. Okay, because in that case, the, the absolute value is not going to be less than greater than one if you have complex solutions. That's a problem. Okay, because you have. I mean, if you take the square of that, this is this is the thing. Okay, so here in that case, it's not going to be. It's not going to be. Okay, that you have complex rules. But in for even for higher order, I mean, if you have cubic equations, then you you basically you have always complex roots in general. Okay, so then it can happen that basically that uh, that the that, that the absolute value of them will be greater than one. Okay, but I cannot represent this in the coordinates.